bliss Kaleidoscope dreams Citrus kisses Like in magazines Sleepy mornings Colorful nights Dancing dreams with you I love it Do 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 Be my shot in the dark Do 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 You're my brand new star What's up, Cedar Mill Youth? Welcome to another night of Youth at Night. Unfortunately, this week we are not at the church building in our watch parties, but we still get to connect 
on this YouTube premiere. So thank you so much for joining us. If this is your first time engaging with Cedar Mill Youth, I just wanna ask you, invite you, check out the description below and click that link so that we can stay connected with you and get you some information on how to continue to stay connected. We have some awesome stuff plans tonight. We've got a couple of fun segments and then we're also continuing our teaching series called All the Feels. So for this first segment, me and Luke, We'd been watching Shark Tank lately. We were like, man, we should pitch something to the students. So I want you to start thinking as if you're a shark looking to invest in us entrepreneurs. Luke and I are gonna do a pitch to you. We wanna hear in the chat, would you buy this product? Would you invest in this product? And to what extent? Thanks guys, we'll see you soon. Sharks, I want to first begin my presentation by telling you a story. I was in the second grade, and I was in class, and it was 2.30. I was going to be out of school in 15 minutes, and I started to, my lunch started to not really tide me over. I can still remember waiting in the classroom for the bell, bell to ring so that I could go across to the gas station, and so that I could spend my my $2.50 on a can of Pringles to tide me over till dinner. And I walked in and I looked, there was French onion and there was barbecue. And, and I went with the barbecue. You know, it was, a, it was a Pringles can and I thought, this is just the right size. I think it'll get me through till dinner. And I purchased it. And I ate three quarters of the can. I was most of the way through and I was almost full. And I just needed to finish my Pringles can. <laughs> and my hand wouldn't fit to the bottom of my can. And so I tried to dump it out into my other can. <laughs> and it fell on the floor. And I have been working <laughs> tired. Tires, tirelessly since then to make sure that no young boy and no young girl would ever waste a Pringle again. Sharks, I have been through 15 prototypes that have bankrupt me and my family. <laughs> we have been barely making it through. <laughs> I have signed my soul over to corporate companies and I have finally brought the perfect product to you. I present this stick partnered with this Pringled can will bring to you snacking unhindered. That's what I'm talking about. No boy or girl ever goes hungry again, unable to reach their Pringles. is gonna transform your eating habits. It's a modern day snack miracle. Working in tandem with this can, as you can see, it works like a push pop. This Pringle can now lets me eat my snack unhindered. I'm looking for someone to buy me out. Someone to purchase this business, take it off my hands for 1.5 bill. This business can be yours. I'll, I will seriously beg you to buy it. And I promise you won't regret it. Thanks for joining us tonight. Sharks, my name is Nick Mastrude, and boy, do I have a treat for you. 
2020 has completely shifted our way of living. And while everyone's rummaging around shifting how they're living, I've been shifting how I am thinking, how I can make you sharks the most money possible. Have you ever stepped out of your car in 2020 and ran to the store or stepped into the coffee shop and went, oh no, I forgot my mask. It happens to me almost every time until I thought the right thing up and that is called the shask, the shirt mask. Look at this. Woohoo! We have completely transformed what it looks like to live in 2020 freedom. Let's go with a small investment from you joining my team as 50 50 partners. Let's take over the world with Shask. Who's with me? What's up, church family? The last few weeks, we have been talking about <laughs> emotions. We're, we're entitling this teaching series, All the Feels, and we kind of laid out the groundwork the last few weeks, which is this. Emotions at their core are super good. They can tell us when something is wrong. They, they instill in us this beautiful um, desire to fight against injustice. They actually emotions can actually mobilize us to be more like Jesus. But when we strive for Jesus to be the boss of our lives, which is what we're trying to do as followers of Jesus, emotions cannot be the thing that actually rule our lives. If Jesus is going to be in that place, we're, we're talking about what it looks like to experience all the feels, but not allow those feelings to rule our lives. And I want to start today with a proverb. It's Proverbs 4 verse 23. It says this, above all else, in other words, this is, the, to the greatest extent, value this thing above everything else. Guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. What Solomon was saying as he, as he wrote this is, is, what is, what is going on inside of you, he's saying, is very, very important. And why is that? Because what comes out of you actually originates deep within inside of you. We can all try to, to, to watch our actions and to monitor the behaviors that we have, but oftentimes the behavior isn't the issue. It's much deeper than that. It's far deeper within. The real task we are up against is taking care of what's on the inside because good or bad, whatever is inside of us will, as this proverb talks about, will come out of us eventually. Let's be honest with ourselves. We can all admit that we have some problems on the inside, right? Most of us can quickly think of things that we've done or said that no one else is allowed to know about because we all have stuff inside of us that is um, less than great, to say the least. And, and when that stuff comes out of us, we do or we say things um, to people and the result is usually um, something that, that, that has control over our lives. So today, specifically, we are talking about the feeling and the, and the, and the experience of guilt. Guilt. Guilt is a loaded word. Guilt is what we feel when we do something that we know we shouldn't have or said something that we know we shouldn't have, and we carry this weight because we know that we done messed up. That's how we say it in Baker. I done messed up. Or that person's, this person is messed up. So it's when we carry this weight like, holy smokes, this was a bad decision. What do I do now? It's what Adam and Eve felt in the garden when they go, holy smokes, we are naked, and they hid from God. They felt horrible. They felt like they had messed up. And let me just say that this feeling of guilt, it isn't a bad thing in and of itself because it, become, it becomes a problem when your life is crippled and ruled by the weight that guilt can place on your life. And oftentimes, 
guilt leads to shame. I think guilt and shame are a little bit different. I've heard it be differentiated like this. I've heard it said, guilt says you've done something bad, but shame says you are bad. You see the difference there? Guilt says you did that, you shouldn't have done that. Let's go to Jesus. Shame says because you've done this thing, you are bad. Because you've done something, that is now your identity. The most common reaction to feeling guilt is hiding and ignoring the feeling or suppressing it um, or, or monitoring our behavior. Even though we're carrying this weight, we monitor our behavior so that we don't expose ourselves to others. We don't want other people to know that we're feeling the way that we are. And oftentimes, we know we're guilty when we start justifying what we've done. We start saying things like this, at least I'm not as bad as that person. Have you ever felt yourself saying that on the inside? You're like, ah, oh, oh, I did this thing, but I didn't do what that kid did. Or maybe you start saying things like this. It's not all my fault. Like other people are to blame here. Like I probably wouldn't have done this if this person wouldn't have done that. Well, we're beginning to justify these things. Or maybe you've said something like this. I did that thing, but I won't do it again. It's the last time. Like God, just let's wipe this clean because I'm not going to do it again. And we'll just agree upon that. And we tell ourselves these stories to make the guilt less powerful so that we don't quite feel as bad. But here's the thing. When we make excuses for our guilt or pretend like it's not a big deal, the guilt doesn't go away. We actually end up giving our guilt more power and we actually prolong its place in our lives. We, we experience guilt, and you may have experienced it this way, like a weight. And when we carry around a weight, it throws us off balance. And, and carrying the weight of guilt um, it, it makes our lives wobbly, for lack of better terms, which explains why when we fix a relationship and we make it right, we often say something like this, I feel like a weight has been lifted off me. Have you ever felt like that? You've finally fessed up to something, you've said something that has been bear bearing weight on you, and you're like, finally, I'm relieved from this weight. The truth is, though, is we're all guilty of something. We are all in danger of letting this guilt that we experience turn into shame. And Jesus has something better for us than to have to live from that place. We, we don't like people pointing out where we may have gotten it wrong, right? That, it's hard to, to come to grips with that. And there's a reason for that. Because um, if we own up to our guilt and admit that what we did wasn't okay, we'll see um, what we did, what it, what, what it actually is. And you want to know what it actually is when we feel this guilt? It's usually because we have engaged with what is called sin. And that can leave us feeling really condemned. Saying I've done the wrong thing is a lot less, inten a lot less intense than saying, dude, you sinned, <laughs> right? Because sin can bring in the, these, these feelings of condemnation or conviction or a, like I'm being judged. In other words, we'll feel bad because we'll see that we did something bad and we can't undo that thing or we can't unsay that thing or untalk that way or untreat that person the way that we did. And eventually we realize that even though this thing is in the past, it's not completely gone. It's still there as a part of our story. But here's the good news. You don't have to be defined by your past. Man, this is great news for my life. Because let me just say that I, I have done some things in the past that I'm so grateful that yes they are a part of my story but they do not define who I am. You do not have to, to you don't have to deny that that's a part of your past either. We don't just say yeah I'm forgiven let's never bring it up again. Jesus offers actually a different way, a way to no longer be controlled by your guilt or shame, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. I want to look at something the apostle Paul said. And it's important that we know who Paul was um, and that he had probably more regret and guilt than all of us online right now joining together combined. Like, he wasn't just a preacher trying to make a point. He, he knows what it's like to be ashamed of, of his past and to feel guilty. Because for the early part of his life, before he became known as like the Apostle Paul, he was actually known as Saul of Tarsus. And Saul spent most of his time hunting down followers of Jesus so that he could arrest them, so that they could be tortured, and some of them even, yes, killed. It's crazy. He didn't just like let these things happen. He was actually the one that made sure it did happen. But then Paul's life radically changed. He became a follower of Jesus. Instead of seeking to harm Jesus followers, he actually made his life mission to encourage people to follow Jesus. Pretty gnarly story. If you don't know it, I encourage you to read it. But there... There's no question 
that now that he's following Jesus, that he was dealing with regret and guilt, knowing what he had done and remembering the faces of these families that he went to to torment. Now he's like in community with these people. Do you think that he probably felt, holy smokes, what have I done? But what makes his story so amazing is that he doesn't distance himself from his past. He doesn't run away from it. He doesn't hide it or deny it. He doesn't make excuses like, well, that was before I met Jesus. It doesn't really count. Like instead, he told his story and he owned up to it and he wrote about it in this letter to um, the Romans, the Roman Christians. And this is what he said. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. Dude, because of Jesus, you and I were set free from the law of sin and death. In other words, he tells people that because of Jesus, something new has happened. You don't have to pretend that you didn't do anything wrong. There is freedom in owning up to what God, um, what owning up to, to God about what you said or what you did or whatever that is. And when you call it what it is, the weight comes off. There is freedom. The law that says, hey, you've sinned and actually death is the result of sin, you can actually release that because of Jesus. You can stop running and making excuses. You can let all of that go and find freedom. And Paul, imagine how relieving that is for Paul. Like, oh, that's, we, that's the same relief that we get experienced. Like, oh, I don't have to carry this weight. There is power in recognizing our weakness because it points us towards the power that God has. So, Paul continues, if, if you see Romans 8, 3, it says this, For what the law was powerless to do, because it was weakened by the flesh, in other words, all the law could do was actually show us how wrong we are. Like, people are always like, look at all these commandments. Basically, what they do is they point out the ways that we've messed up. But it really can't fix anything for us. It, it, it can't take the weight away from us. And it definitely doesn't give us freedom. If anything, it puts more, like, it just reveals how broken we really are. Um, and then he continues. He says, God did this. God um, completed this by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. Meaning, Jesus had no guilt. He did nothing wrong. He came and he lived the perfect life. He... Um, he got what he didn't deserve to give us what we didn't deserve. I've heard it said like that. We have every reason to feel guilty. And Jesus has not a single reason to feel guilty. And yet Jesus is the one who died. And because of that, we no longer have to live in guilt and shame. Think of it this way. Because of Jesus, guilt no longer has to be the boss of you. We can live guilt-free because Jesus took that on his own shoulders. He carried the weight and, and brought it to completion. Paul wraps up the thought by saying this. And so he, God, condemned sin in the flesh, condemned sin, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. So the law, the requirements that we're always like that we used to fight to, to achieve, Jesus done away with that. Who, who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Paul is saying, God has made the relationship between you and him, me and him, guilt-free. Yes, we are guilty because we've done something we shouldn't have. We all have, but we are not condemned, and that guilt does not define us anymore. What Jesus did on the cross is the thing that defines you. It's the only final thing. Jesus took it on himself, and now we are free because of it. So here's the thing. The way Paul writes can be a little bit confusing. And if you're sitting there thinking, what does this even mean? Um, I totally get that. But I, want, I don't want us to miss this because it sounds a little bit confusing. Like, don't check out here. We're going to get to the application point here. When you decide to take God at his word, when, when you trust that Jesus is who he says he is and did what he said he was going to do, a few things begin to happen in these terms. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to list these three things. The first one is this. You don't have to condemn yourself or punish yourself. Guilt is, if it's not going to be the boss of you, and, and if you're going to be, belong to God, you don't, do not have to be up on yourself. God says that you are not condemned. So when that voice of shame or guilt tries to weigh on you, you can say, Jesus took care of that for me. That's not who I am anymore. I belong to Jesus. Second thing is this. Your guilt will remind you, but it will not define you. Meaning, what you did 
To be honest, it won't just disappear. You may have some lessons to learn, but, th but that thing you did, that thing you said, it isn't who you are. Friends, those of you specifically dealing with guilt and shame right now because of some things you've done, that is not who you are. Jesus tells you who you are. And the third thing is this. You don't get to condemn others for their mistakes. When you realize what Jesus has done for your guilt, you understand that he's done the same thing for other people. When other people have wronged you, you go, there's grace for you. There's forgiveness for you. You don't get to judge or hate or criticize others for their mistakes. Your past makes you perfectly positioned to love everyone else despite their mistakes. So today, I want you to remember that as long as we hold on to guilt, we are continuing to allow our past to define us, but Jesus has set us free from that. Jesus came to change that reality. Our past can remind us, but it does not have to define us. Maybe today is the day that that changes. Let me pray for you. Jesus, we are so grateful that we do not have to bear the weight of the wrongdoings that we have done, but Jesus has come and he has already done that and it is a completed reality. God, help us to not allow our past to define us, but help us... Help it just be a tool to motivate us to give even more of ourselves to you. God, we want you to be the boss of our lives. We don't want guilt or shame to rule us. We surrender this time to you. Have your way in our small groups as we converse about this. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.